the General Assembly and it's approved, will the governor appoint and then there'll be an election or will it be an election for the... What generally happens is the governor appoints and fills a vacancy and then that person has to run within a two-year period. So they have a very limited time there. But those vacancies are always filled uh, by the governor. Your, your state court, remember, processes more cases than all the other courts combined. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, yes, Mr. Page. Uh, I noticed on page two, our case filings at 25,209. I, I know you mentioned that uh, some crimes have not, they're not felonies anymore. They're passed back down the state court. But why would we have such a high rate, even with that taken into account? When you look at Bibb with 11,976 and Forsyth, which are much larger counties than us, why are you having such a higher caseload? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, the two best examples I can give you is that Lowndes County is a magnet county, as you know. Folks come from all over the surrounding counties into Lowndes County to shop, to do business, to work. And some of those individuals, not all, thank goodness, but some of those individuals come into Lowndes County and commit crimes. You also have I-75 running through there. And if you look at the number of cases that traverse the exits on I-75 every single day, if you've not looked at those numbers, you'll, you will be shocked. And unfortunately, a lot of those people come through Lowndes County and they are drunk, uh, intoxicated, they are high on prescription medication, they are speeding, they are driving on a suspended license. They have no tag. They have no license. They have no insurance. And unfortunately, a lot of those cases that come through, those folks get to come see me. And that, those, I can list about 10 others, but those two things would be the primary reasons. You also have a lot of law enforcement here in Lowndes County. A lot of agencies, as I said. Um, and of course, in, in, if you, you're just comparing our caseload to a few counties here. Right. If you compare it to the caseload of the, the counties that are larger than us, you will see uh, truly large caseloads that go into the hundreds of thousands of cases, as you can imagine. Mr. Chairman, you have a question. Yes. I had a question. Um, you know, in, in regards to, I mean, first and foremost, I appreciate everything you do, and I, I value what you what you're Thank saying. You. Um, as with everything come finance, how much money are we looking at if we go to fund an additional judge? I can't give you a specific number at this point, at this moment in time. I know that Mr. Pritchard, Ms. Black can give you the, the statistics on exactly what that would cost to fund an additional position. And, you know, because it is more than mere salary, uh, because there are benefits involved and all of that, I would prefer they give you an actual number as to what that is. Um, one of the things I, I one of the things that is frowned upon for judges, of course, is to get into the specifics of numbers because we don't operate the court as a revenue source in terms of what we as judges do every day. I was just bringing it up because I know we, we, we really had a tight budget this yeah. time frame and it was really, Very really, nice. really tight and, and, and even thinking about adding, say, a hundred plus thousand or what have you to, to the, that particular area, I don't know how to go, but that's all I had. Well, okay. let me just again say to you, without trying to get into any more specifics than I must, remember that in terms of what your court does and the revenue that it generates to fund the positions and what the court does, if you take the revenue of all of your other courts combined, they will not equal what your state court generates in revenue. And I say that because a cut then to any service you provide is going to affect and potentially reduce that revenue. So we do need to proceed carefully in terms of if the county says to me, if you all say to me, it just cannot be done, then we must be careful about how we proceed after that. How can you cut services when you're mandated to try certain cases? How would that work? The services that you would have to cut would be things that are within the court's discretion. Most things are not. There are very few services you can cut you would limit probably violations of probation would be the first thing. Where would that go? Where would it go? Yeah, I mean, who would who would address those issues? If we're not able to fund another judge, they wouldn't be you have to cut, so we would have people violating probation and they would not be brought into the court system to this, deal with that issue? This has happened in other counties where there is simply no funding to do that. And that is the only discretionary power the court has. Of course, that means that folks 
generally will stop reporting to probation and they will stop paying their fines and fees. But as you pointed out, Ms. Page, the problem there is that I can't deny somebody a trial. I can't deny someone a motion hearing. I can't deny someone an arraignment process. All of these are mandated under state law, and the court will provide those regardless. Um, there are really very few things, if any, that the court has any discretionary control over under the law. Uh, probation violations is one of the only things. Are you taking on cases that are normally or historically have been superior court cases and now they're being Yes, that is already we pushed your because I know it's, you mentioned some things there. Forgery uh, being one. Forgery was not, never handled by the state court. We handle bad check cases all the time. Lots and lots of bad check cases. Uh, but we have never had to handle forgery before we do now. In addition, some of the cases that we have always handled, uh, shoplifting, for example, well, part of the criminal justice reform was to raise the threshold of what is a misdemeanor versus a felony. By raising that threshold, all of those cases that were felonies now stand mm -hmm. up. They still are just shoplifting. They are just more of them. Uh, breaking into someone's home is still a felony. Breaking into someone's tool shed in the backyard is now a misdemeanor again. So all of those things are being impacted. And of course, you will continue to see the Criminal Justice Reform Commission is not finished. Uh, there will be further cutbacks in terms of what are felonies, and they will continue to shift burden upon the county in order to absorb it. Judge Ed. Yes, sir, Ms. Powell. Yeah, a handful of questions. With the new judge position, what additional staff will you need to support that judge? What additional spacing needs are you thinking about for the judge, for the staff, and for courtroom space? Uh, I'm thrilled to say that with regard to the space, we are, we are OK. Good. You know, the, the chambers exist. It was built into the plan uh, when state court was created on the fourth floor. So that space is there. The courtroom space is there. Again, thank goodness. Okay. We can operate, and we already do operate, two judges in two courtrooms pulling from the same jury pool. Sometimes we operate with three judges because Superior Court is also pulling from that same jury pool as we uh, select juries uh, in criminal trials or, or civil trials. Um, that's a huge savings to our community, to our taxpayers, because it means we only summon one group of potential jurors. If we can all three pull from that pool, that of course we're not having to bring in multiple pools. And we can select very easily and pull groups. We just pull them into each courtroom and we select juries from that and can move forward and plan our whole week. What we try to do now, and like when I came up in the practice of law, is that we go ahead and try to select all the juries for the entire week. And that way, by the end of the day, Monday, in most cases, I can say the jury, you know, you're on a jury for Tuesday, you're on a jury for Wednesday, you're on a jury for Thursday, and then I can release the rest of the pool. That again reduces the commitment and obligation of the community, I mean of the commission and the county to pay those individuals uh, to have to return it. And they like it because they feel like their time's not being wasted. So they really do appreciate it. So, so the staffing needs for the office the for the judges, will you need any additional staff to Obviously support the judges? At judge? some point, the answer to that question is yes. But I would say not in the immediate. Okay. So the judge is the primary issue. It's not, judge, you don't have to have a judge plus two. The, re the reason I say that, now obviously, would I like that? Yes. Do we need it? Absolutely. But I understand the complaint. Take one bite of the elephant at a time. Well, the, the reality is we've worked very hard for a long time in state court. Mm -hmm. and we're all used to it. Uh, Cindy and Becky are here. Uh, they're not just a eight to five job. That's fine. You know, we made that commitment. We appreciate our work. We appreciate what we do and give back to the community. And we will continue to do that. The problem right now is that everything bottlenecks at a judge because the judge is the one person in the courtroom who must touch everything. Okay. The final question I had a, had a note on down here was, are, are, we, are you able to assess any fees to help offset the cost of the courts? I am not allowed to assess any fees whatsoever that are not prescribed by law or by this commission's decree. In fact, doing so has gotten more than one judge uh, out of office. Right. Okay. That is pretty well, illegal. Okay. 
but the commission and or state or state legislature can look at assessing a if you assess a ten dollar fee and you've got twenty five thousand cases a year you're starting to offset a substantial amount of your court case well, I'll, I'll say to you Ms. Thompson, what a lot of commissions and, and municipalities have done is they will set up a technology system for example um, that allows the, the county to recoup some of the cost of the technology that is needed and required to be able to process and operate court. Okay. and that's a very legitimate thing for i think the commission to look at and pursue it if they are interested in doing that um, Remember the fee, the county gain uh, from the transaction of the case is, is the fine imposed by the court. Um, what I think a lot of folks don't know is when I impose a fine of $75 for a speaking ticket, as you all may know, there are about uh, 10 <laughs> surcharges that are then backed out under our current formulation of that. So the county only keeps a very small percentage. Right. Like most people think, oh, the county is just you know, able to keep all this money from a single ticket. It does not matter what type of case it is. It all has these fees, and some of them have many more fees than others, um, depending upon the legislature. All of that money goes to the county. Just out of curiosity for our records, if you could if you get a moment, if you give us a breakdown of what some of those fees are and Glad where you. they go. I'll be more than happy. I can tell you to the point. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Judge Edwards, yes, thank sir, you Mr. very much for You're your welcome. presentation and thank you for what you and your staff does for this county. I know that you do have a tremendous load. And again, this is something that we will be looking at for you and looking at it very seriously in the coming up. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. We're proud to do it. Thank yes, you, sir. Thank, thank you. you.